No, look, it's the human element this year. So this year, everybody's got to be there in person to speak. Face to face. Face to face, in person. Nice. Real life. Can we say IRL? Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm calling it biggest AIEC ever. Uh, uh, until next year. Until next year. <laughs> G'day and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Maliki from the Global Society, coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of the Koala News, and I'm coming to you from Wadjuk Noongar country over in Perth, WA. We have a funny intro there, Dirk. I feel like there was this pregnant pause for both of us. Well, like, what's going on? Good afternoon. We both need a coffee. And just before we started filming, I showed you the last time looking at home. My back. <laughs> so I've got this little massage thing going on one of those massage machines. So if you hear... I wasn't going to mention the noise that it makes, Rob. I was not going to mention the noise that it makes. I'm broken today, mate. It's one of those things where halfway through the year, everybody needs a holiday. <laughs> but enough about that. Let's let's get into some of the news. And first up, maybe we can talk about IDP, who have uh, just released their latest Pulse survey, concentrating on Australia and New Zealand. And they've a good sample size out of this survey, over 15 Yeah, it's decent. Students. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, what do they call it? Valid. It would be a valid survey. Look, there's been lots going on and there's been lots of organisations, I guess, covering off student sentiment over the last little bit and looking at student sentiment as it relates to, I guess, some of the, the government changes that have been coming through and not just here, but you know, in Canada, the UK and in New Zealand. So yeah, this IDP Pulse survey, 15,500, a valid survey, some really interesting outcomes in terms of, I mean, I I'll just run down a, a kind of a preset list that we've got here. But, you know, in terms of student financial requirement policy knowledge, this really surprised me. 75% of respondents are aware, and this rises to 90% of respondents out of India and Nepal, are actually aware of what's going on or feel confident enough that they're aware that they're going on. And I guess I did, what IDP's comment is, is that really shows the strength of the education ecosystem in getting the word out there in terms of these updates. So yeah, it's fascinating. You know, I think back probably, you know, 10, 15 years and you'd be lucky to get 50%. So it, people have got their finger on the pulse. Things happen, obviously, with the internet these days. God, I'm really showing my age there. But just with the way that spe- the speed of information and the way that people access it, having, you know, between 75 and 90% in certain locations, I think is testament to how small a global community we are these days. So yeah, so that, that was the first one. The second one was around the cost of student visa. This was fascinating. I, I read this. Fascinating. Twice. Absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. So, yeah, so it shows that nearly two thirds of respondents so the cost of a student visa will not influence their decision to study in Australia. However, it still leaves a sizable third that are impacted, and particularly from certain markets, and the Philippines and Bangladesh jumped to mind there. But they did note that demand for Australia dipped on the announcement. I think this one's still got a fair way to play out, to be fair. And again, this is we're talking about student sentiment here. We're not talking about actual numbers coming through the door. So whether students actually knew how much the visa got up to or what the deal was, you know, if they think it's a 5% increase and, and yep, that's no big deal. It'll be interesting though, I think, to see, to see this one play. But yeah, again, interesting data that, that came out of the survey. It's also one of those things, I guess you're asked a question out of context saying, you know, does it change your perspective about studying in Australia? The fact that the visa's gone up, even if you know how much that is, Maybe if people say, no, 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 it doesn't, doesn't affect it because they've been thinking about it for some period of time. But of course, that all changes when you start to do the maths on it and you start looking at degree costs, accommodation costs, visa costs, and suddenly maybe further down, as you said, down that decision-making pipeline, people go, actually, there's this great education option in Canada, USA, fill in the blank, <laughs> and it's going to be 10% cheaper, 20% cheaper, whatever. Maybe that's where we get stung. I guess the other thing that, that actually is not reflected in this statistic, it's one thing to know how much it costs, but as we've talked about on the Global Horizons podcast, is the fact that there's now this uncertainty about your visa actually being approved, the roll of the dice. So it's one thing, you know, putting seven, eight hundred dollars at at play, but sixteen hundred? I don't know. That's a very different equation. Yeah, it can be a bit risky. Interestingly enough, moving on to the next point, New Zealand versus Australia. So New Zealand-bound students are more price sensitive, which is interesting, than Australian-bound students. So 50% going to New Zealand claim the cost of a student would be influential in their decision. So that's a significant difference there between, I guess, the student demographic that's being drawn to Australia or New Zealand. Australia's policy shift will benefit New Zealand, no doubt, particularly with students from the Philippines and Pakistan. And New Zealand didn't see an upward shift in demand yet since the visa announcement either. So again, 
probably a little bit left to play here. And I think there's another survey that's being done August, September time, which will be released at AIEC. And of course, we've got Louise on later on in the show to talk a little bit about AIEC. So it'd be interesting to see what sort of data is presented around that. The last one that kind of caught my eye was around market differences. So India and China appear to be committed to sticking to Australia, and despite a, the significant visa increase. But markets like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam appear more likely to consider their options. So again, kind of makes sense. I mean, if we're, again, depending on the financial demographic within the country that we're talking about, if we're talking about, you know, higher financially astute people in India and China, then that's probably going to continue to be, you know, sort of less elastic, if or more elastic, as opposed to other countries where they may be still, I don't want to say scraping things together, but, you know, still more probably on that, on that price sensitive scale. So again, I think the next six months will really show this in, in more detail, but interesting insights nonetheless. It's fascinating, isn't it? As we talked about in the last episode, I'm really curious to see how this all shakes out in hmm. national GDP figures once we kind of get through to the start of next year. And this has had a chance to kind of flow through the system. And we see those, all you know, the visa rejection rates that have gone through the roof and all of that washes through into the real economy. I'll, I'm fascinated to see how that plays out going into what's going to be an election year. Maybe we can move sideways into into student stories because you occasionally publish some really nice student stories in the Koala. Yeah, mate, when the Koala was kind of set up, one of the things that I wanted to look at was maintaining that student voice. And it's to be fair, it's probably been difficult to do that in the last six months with so much going on in, in the government. The other thing is I really like a diversity of views coming through the Koala. So, you know, it's not just me writing or it's not just myself and a couple of others writing, but there's a real diversity. So I'm often approached by people to publish stories or to publish articles or publish opinion pieces. And I try to do that as much as I can. This fellow, like Christian Carrari, he, he approached me probably some month, about a month or so ago, and he said, you know, he had this story that he wanted to, to kind of submit to me to look over. And it was a story about a student, and I, I, I won't give away too much, but a story that a student that was close to Christian who had this kind of, who had a student experience. And the student experience was one of decision-making. So the student arrived or, or was just about to leave or just about to commence the course, and the course got pulled, and they had to rethink what am I going to do? And then they got here and they, you know, they made decisions. And then that student is now just, I think, 35 and eight months years old. And now the government makes a decision about working and about being able to obtain post-study work visas. And she's just outside the limit. So again, a whole other story unravels around, you know, being able to work that extra little bit, being able to potentially pay off any loans or, or any money that's been saved or recoup some of that money that may have been spent on education, which is normal for, for students who want to stay back for a year and work. So it's a fascinating insight into the student journey, student decision making, the touching on, I don't want to use the word mental health, but certainly the psychology that sits behind making these decisions, anxiety that comes with it, and just the, the pressure on the impact and outcomes that these decisions can make because they're massive. And so if anyone does get the opportunity to read this, I think it's a really fascinating story and, and hats off to Christian for, for putting it forward. Really, really supportive of, of these types of things. I really did enjoy reading this. It's, it's coincidental that we've got Louise Gould on from IDP to talk about the AIEC conference a little bit later on. A theme of which this year is the human element. And mm. this, this article really spoke to me about the real humanness of the decisions, the human impact of the decisions that are being made at the moment. You know, here's somebody that's you know, trying to make decisions to do the best thing for their life. And essentially, it just becomes a point in a game that's way bigger than them. They've got absolutely yeah. no control of and it's just thrown into this incredible uncertainty about what the future holds. And I think, I think it's a dangerous situation any time we lose sight of, of, of those real people at the end of the line. It's one thing to say, oh, we've got to shut the door on dodgy agents and people who are non-genuine. But it's almost yep. like living life you know, focused on the negative rather than focusing yep. on the vast, overwhelming majority, the 99% of people. We're doing the right thing, going about things the right way, trying to make uh, take advantage of what we offer and are getting messed around. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I'll drop the, the link to that article in the show notes. So if you're interested in picking that article up from the Koala, check it out in the show notes. English Australia has made interesting, small, small news, but interesting all the same. Made change to the way they're holding yeah, so English Australia has essentially announced to the membership that for the foreseeable future, they're going to do monthly meetings and they're just going to be open meetings for members to be able to voice opinions, be able to do that. In a normal climate, this wouldn't even, this wouldn't make the news, let's be honest. 
But in the current climate where this government changes are impacting and biting, this is a really smart move by English Australia. And I say that for a couple of reasons. The first one is, you know, I think we, we spoke a little bit of maybe two podcasts ago about the potentially some of the, the crosshairs of the higher education lobby and, and the positioning where some universities have come out and said, well, if I'm going to have caps, let's make them small caps. And then the ATN came out and said, well, maybe we should just have a flat cap. And the group of eight kind of said, well, I don't know about that. And, and I think we, we kind of termed it divide and conquer. So this is really smart on behalf of English Australia, making sure that their members, or maybe making sure that there's a hymn sheet that everyone's singing from, as opposed to people going off in different directions and making different statements on these changes. I think it's also smart because it's not just about English Australia hearing from members and making sure that that is, is packaged up into the advocacy position, but it's also good for members to understand what English Australia has been doing for them over the last little bit as well. So it's a really good, you know, I guess, two-way communication piece where direct discussion with members at the moment is, again, just, it's a really smart move. So hats off to Ian Ed and the English Australia board for making this happen. And let's hope that the English sector has a, a strong, viable advocacy position that, that everyone's on board with over the next little bit. Yeah, and they've obviously been significantly impacted and once mm. again, we're going to see that flow through over the next 12 months. So that's right. major, major impacts continue to flow through that, that part of the yep. sector. In terms of, I guess, for those that don't understand or don't know the backstory of this merger, when the current South Australian Labor government came into power, they looked at, I guess, a feasibility study for bringing together the two universities on the terrace. So that is the University of Adelaide and the University of South Australia. The idea at this point in time was that maybe three universities in South Australia was a little bit too many and bringing those together would maximise scale and have international penetration. The two vice chancellors at the time, Peter Hoy and uh, David Lloyd, uh, got together and a working committee was established and it slowly progressed through different channels. That goes right up into, I guess, memorandums of understanding were signed. And I want to say that was probably about a year or so ago to the point now where they're, they've come together. I know that they've advertised for their senior staff now. Uh, I think there's eight deputy vice chancellors across the university. And literally the, the party last week was around unveiling their new visual identity and being able to talk a little bit about the steps forward. So again, a new university for the city of Adelaide and the state of South Australia, bringing together you know, the historical University of Adelaide and the relatively newer University of South Australia, who will now become members of the group of eight as well. So that's a bit of a loss for the ATN. Obviously, the University of South Australia drops out of the ATN, but the GO8 now gains what will everyone anticipates to be a, a behemoth of a university that, whose research punch should be, should be quite maximised, as well as a, a large student body. So kudos to, to South Australia for pulling it off. And it'll be interesting to see the journey over the first couple of years as to how that comes together. My social channels this week lit up with everybody I know in Adelaide pretty much Just pretty much posting, posting the announcement that finally Adelaide University is live. New website, new branding. What was your initial reaction when you sort of saw the announcements, uh, saw some of the branding and, and, and the messaging about where things are heading? Look, overall, I think it looks really good. If I if I wanted to be cheeky, I'd probably say that I was always expecting red to be the colour, um, just given that it's the state colour. So having a blue colour kind of I, I look sideways at, but I think it looks really good. It looks clean. It looks fresh. It uh, looks congruent to a kind of a new age university, which Adelaide University is wanting to be, notwithstanding its past and its history through both the University of Adelaide and the University of South Australia. So I think, you know, that it, by and large, it's coming together well. I have seen the new website. So they're, they're obviously, for recruiting for international students, you've got to kind of be out there a couple of years beforehand. So I do understand that there's about 200 degrees that are up on their website at the moment. I don't actually know whether they've been Krakos registered, but I'm assuming that, that if they haven't been, they would be in the process of it. But there's 200 degrees, which would enable international admissions ahead of opening its doors in 2026. So that's a really good thing for them and thinking ahead. So they've, they've done well on that one. Yeah, from what I understand, I can, I'm just on the website now. I can see that they have got their Krakos number for the institution as a whole. And from what I understood, from folks inside that whole process is that all of the kind of main degrees that are going to be taught are, are deep into the process, if not through that process. So yeah, I guess say that Good. Um, they'll be coming to market very soon with all of the offerings that you would expect. And what are your thoughts on the branding, Mark? Yeah, I quite like it. I did have a good poke around the website. Obviously, a lot of data still to come across, a lot of information still to come across. But my initial feeling was, was quite positive. I do like mm -hmm. the colours. Blue, I think, works well. 
And yeah, this institution really is going to be a powerhouse, isn't it? I guess that's that was the whole backstory between the merger in general. I really rate the leadership teams at both institutions. VCs, DVC teams are both incredibly strong, great staffing, exceptional research. So in terms of like overall strategy, I think it's a, it's a fantastic move. Always the, the detail is going to be interesting when it comes down to like culture between institutions. And this is outsider's perspective, of course, but I, I tend to get the feeling that UDSA is probably a bit more nimble and entrepreneurial. UOA is probably that. a bit more traditional, traditional model of uh, the Sandstone institution. So I'm curious to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. But of course, the institution's essentially giving itself five to 10 years to fully transition from two very different institutions into a single institution moving forward. But I, I do feel like they've got smart, empathetic leaders that, that are you know trying to keep their fingers on the pulse of what's going on and they should be able to handle that. So yeah, I thought it was good. Very promising start. So good on to all the people down there in Adelaide who are working so hard to make it happen. And for those of you in the industry who who know people in Adelaide, like it's been a lot of work. People haven't just been doing their business as usual work, but they've literally been doing second jobs, trying to come up with how the structures are going to work, what needs to be merged together, what's going to stay, what's going to go. So the amount of workload on people at all levels of the institutions has been phenomenal. So, you know, that success, this ongoing success is, is their success. So hats off to all of them. Amen. Amen. One thing we, we picked up this week in the Koala was actually ISEF and their, uh, their CEO, Marcus Batty. He's actually celebrating 20 years in a row now. I went back through their website and wrote a bit of a story, uh, backstory about this, but it's a fascinating story about how an individual who's very, very well respected globally has taken a business which was originally established by his father, joined the business, started differentiating a little bit, created an exhibition kind of company, and then has expanded it to be a global powerhouse in international education. So 20 years in the role last week. Congratulations to Marcus. And yeah, I mean, ISEF's just a, it's a wonderful story of networking globally, bringing people together and a successful global business, which is well respected. So again, congratulations. Tell me a little bit more about ISEF. I don't know them well. I mean, I've come from the learning abroad side of, of international ed, so I haven't had a lot to do with with that space, but what's what's their kind of brief? What's their main main game? My take on it would be that that ISEF, ISIS bread and butter are networking events. So they bring together institutions and agents specifically, and now they're they're moving out of that model somewhat and looking at other kind of I guess meetup events between different education education providers and institutions. But that's probably been their their bread and butter for. I don't know, I'd say the better part of 20 years. They've now moved into other spaces. So they obviously, they've got ISEF Monitor, which is a, a real facts-based journalism source of information and a really quality one. They've moved into accreditation. So they have the, uh, that. And then they've also got the ISEF Academy, which is a professional development, which again, institutions can take advantage of. And I think if I'm correct, and I hope I'm, I am, I can even white label out of that as well. So again, just an organization, which on a global scale has been able to see pain points, if I can put it that way, and really fill them really, really well. So you know, in the Koala recently, we've been writing about what they've been doing with the New Zealand government in writing an agent accreditation program. So again, just some of those little snippets that we see from around the world in the work that they do has been amazing, really, really good. And again, it's innovative, it's entrepreneurial, but not to the point of excess, if I can put it that way. They're, they're good folks. I'm always fascinated by these organizations that sort of start off in one area and then manage to seem to be able to move seamlessly into another business stream and continue to grow. And, and suddenly they're big, they're huge. And Yeah. And look, I, did, I didn't even mention how it got founded. So Marcus's father, Carl, started off as an English language school uh, originally. Yeah. So it's amazing. They taught English language to, to, different, to different folks, mainly across uh, the Middle East and, and Europe, I think. So yeah, incredible, incredible story. I'm a little bit jealous, I must admit. Which is that kind of entrepreneur that you know could could like grow a business and yeah you know, take it from one business stream into another and in, then add another one and another one. It just all seems to work. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's real. It's a real art. So respect to them. Amen. Maybe just before we're about to talk conferences with cool. Louise Gould from the conference committee, the program committee for the AIEC conference. But there's another conference the big coming boss. up this week. Yeah. The- <laughs> boss person. Maybe we better put that to her. I'll see what she says. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. There's another another conference coming up next week, of course. Yeah, mate, the Pi Live hits the Gold Coast next week. So the Gold Coast will be a light with international education. It's generally a fairly big a big 
decent site, decent turnout. Certainly, as you mentioned, social media has been blowing up. My social media has been blowing up with the amount of pink from the pie that's been flowing through it lately and the amount of people that have reached out and said, I'll see you next week at the pie, which um, unfortunately I can't attend. But yeah, it's going to be a good week next week and I wish everyone the best there. It's being held the 29th and the 30th of July and it's being presented by Experience Gold Coast, who are also taking the opportunity to launch their new student attraction campaign during the event. So it's going to be interesting. The folks at the at uh, Experience Gold Coast that I've been speaking with have been very tight-lipped, but they said it's going to be unlike anything the education sector's seen before. So that might be a highlight, right? What a tease. When are we going to see a koala live, Dirk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I'm a koala live. <laughs> when, I, when, when I start making a little bit of money, Rob, when I start making a little bit of money, I'll invest it back in. Perfect, perfect. Those of you listening along, if you have budget, you know where you need to spend it. We've got uh, one independent international education news source here in Australia. You need to support it. I love the plug. Thanks, man. I love the plug. <laughs> you can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, gain insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities, from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. All right, Rob, shall we bring in our guest? Yes, Dirk, let's do it. I'm very excited today to have Louise Gould joining us on Global Horizons. Louise, old friend, colleague from the industry, who is the Director of Development and External Relations at the Faculty of Education at Monash University, but... More importantly for all of us in the international education, she is the program boss person for the AIEC <laughs> conference. She is the program czar. <laughs> I think I'll change my title to that. I think I will. <laughs> Can we say grand, grand, grand Pooba? <laughs> Everybody wants to be a czar and have been for, for many, many years. So, Louise, thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. It's my pleasure. It's good to be here and I'm loving all these new titles that I'm getting as well. You're going to have a collection by the end of this podcast. <laughs> uh, I thought we might start because you've been doing this role for, for many years now. And so, um, firstly, let's not, let's not emphasize that too much. <laughs> firstly, though, thank you. Thank you. Because I, I really feel like AIEC is this conference that just keeps getting better. And of course, some of that's about the physical location, the physical things that go on there. But so much of it is about just the way that the program continues to revitalize itself year on year and be relevant and up to date. So that's in no small part your work. Yeah, look, it's not just me. It's a whole team of people. Like, you know, it takes a village to make these things happen. It takes a variety of people from, from the industry, from the sectors that we bring together to help us create the program. I'm just sort of the conductor of the orchestra, if you'd like to put it that way. She brings <laughs> up. The maestro. <laughs> the maestro, the maestro. Yeah, because we have a, there's obviously the steering committee that oversees the whole of the AIEC, but then beneath that is a program committee that, that I chair. We have representatives with from various key interest areas and sectors, and we come together to design and create the program. But what happens first every year, and we're already doing it for 2025, is to come up with a theme. So we have to have a theme that sort of hits the mark and is relevant and so on. And this year, as you know, the theme is the human element. There's so much talk about tech and IT and AI that we have thought we really needed to focus on on the human aspect and human interactions because international education is about people. So, yeah, as I said, we're already thinking about next year. Louise, when, when you start constructing something like that, it's one of the things that we like to do here on, on the Global Horizons podcast is actually kind of lift the contact paper on some of this stuff so our listeners actually get a, a sense of, of what goes on behind the scenes. How early on do you start talking about themes and, and what's the process behind that? I mean, is that a workshop? Is it an email correspondence? Is it, <laughs> is it a, co a, a combination of all of those things? How does that get worked through? So what we do, we're doing it now so that we'll probably – have a theme ready, I would say, sometime in August. We'll be ready for the 2025 theme uh, because a lot hangs around that theme. And the way it works is we do a survey of program committee members, of network conveners from IEAA, from the steering committee, from the wider IDP network, from other stakeholders out there to say, you know, what do you think would be a theme that would be relevant broad enough to cover all key interest areas because you can't have something that just speaks to one sector or, you know, one particular strand, you know, like 
student experience or marketing. It's got to cover everything. Sure. So we do that and then I collate all of that information. I also do a bit of sort of investigative work on what other conferences themes are for the next mm-hmm. year or for this year so that we're not overlapping. And I look back at the past, is it 40 years of themes for the AIEC? <laughs> and I haven't done them for 40 years, let me just say. I haven't done them for 40 years. <laughs> but I look at what we've done so that we don't repeat. And it's, it's starting to get tricky. Yeah. But but that's how it sort of comes together. It has to be relevant and speak to the world as we know it and try and you know use crystal ball a little bit in terms of what might be happening this time next year. It sounds amazing. I never knew that a survey was conducted, for instance. So it, it seems quite collaborative and quite... I don't want to say bottom-up driven, but really kind of circular, if I can put it that way, as opposed to, you know, two or three people sitting in a conference room somewhere and go, right, this is going to be it next year. So that's good to hear. Yeah. Funnily enough, I, Dirk, I reckon I've got one for next year. Well, actually, maybe it'd be good for this year based on everything we've been through in the industry. Get your pen out, Louise. I reckon you're <laughs> riding the roller coaster. <laughs> riding the roller coaster. I like it. Riding Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting times we find ourselves in, hey? Incredible. Tell us a little bit more about that process then of obviously hundreds of proposals received by the steering committee for various sessions and presentations and the like. How do you go through triaging that flood and pulling that, pulling that into what I'm holding in my hand if you're watching this on the video, which is the recently released schedule? That's tricky. We can talk about that in a while. So look, the way that the, the program comes together is there's only so many spots, okay? So we have to realise often really good papers get rejected (laughs) purely because there's not enough space or we already have too many papers on that particular session. So the way it works is each proposal would have a minimum of maybe eight to ten reviewers. So it goes through a review process. The reviewers, as we're reviewing, can't see what anyone else is saying. And we review it against certain standards and we score it out of ten you know, with 10 being absolutely awesome, amazing, must be in. Some get a zero and the zeros are usually not relevant because unfortunately when you advertise a conference, international education, you're going to get proposals on working with early primary school students in non-English speaking countries, which had nothing to do in in terms of our industry. People just misunderstand. So they're just the zeros. And one is like, this is not a very good proposal and and can't, can't make the grade. So that's how we, we go and we do it through the track chairs. So we have in the program committee, we have track chairs. They tend to be from the networks at IEAA. So you're going to have someone looking at the student side of things, someone looking at marketing, someone looking at pathways, someone looking at the school proposals, but there are multiple people looking at the same ones. I review every single proposal and I'm not the only one. A few of us do every single one so that we've got the big picture because otherwise if someone's just reviewed one particular strand, they don't see some of the other sessions that might speak to that as well. So that sort of brings it together. Then we do a lot of workshop shopping. There's about four phases we go through before we, we reach that final selection of which ones are in. Then we have the reserves because not everybody gets the 60-minute session they want. They might get an Inspire session instead of a 60-minute slot. So, yeah, so it's quite complicated. And the schedule you mentioned, Rob, oh, my goodness, that's even more complicated <laughs> Because we've got to make sure there's no overlap of speakers, there's no overlap of content. We've got to make sure people are available on those days. So that's a bit of a moving piece, that one. It actually answers a question that I've had over the years because as I've gone from session to session, I mean, invariably there'll be, there'll be things that you really want to go to because they spark your curiosity. But often like the main thing that I need to go to for my work uh, purposes, th- there's very little overlap there. There's obviously things that I'd like to get to, but... I always wondered how you managed, how that managed to just happen so magically that I didn't have to be in two places at once. It's a juggling act. And and we still, you know, occasionally we'll go, oh my goodness, we've missed that. So we have to move move things around slightly. But yeah. And in terms of the plenary sessions, so they're the, you know, the, the keynote speakers that we have on the Wednesday and on Thursday morning, there's one as well. And then on Friday, we try to make them relate to the theme. So they're very much handpicked in consultation with the steering committee and the program committee. So as you know, like this year with the human theme, each speaker brings something to the audience, whether from within the sector or outside the sector that speaks to that theme and we've all got something to learn from. The Thursday morning is will be the the town hall session, which will be interesting given the roller coaster you talked about, because that will be 
very much looking at the Australian international education strategy in the current climate and audience driven, audience driven. So yeah, they need their questions ready. Yep. So tell us a little bit more about that that particular session. The town hall. So it's a, it's a town hall session. So it'll be people like Phil Honeywood from IEA. It'll be, I think, Study Melbourne are on it. We've got quite a few high level people on it. Karen Sandercock from from the department in in Canberra, who are there really to answer the audience's questions rather than talking heads on stage and doing presentations. With the town hall format, we trialed last year for the first time, and it worked really well. So the audience can send their questions through. It'll be convened by Stan Grant. Stan is our MC this year. We're so excited. We had him last year, but yes, we've got him again this year. And he'll be there for each day of the conference. But he'll he'll facilitate that session. But yeah, so the town hall, if people are listening, have your questions ready for both government and the association to, to answer. How will people be able to submit those? So the way it's working at the conference these days is that it's through the app. So it gets sent straight through to, to whoever's chairing or MCing the session, which is good. It's, it's much easier than there's the next call to action is make sure you download the app yep download the app and make sure you know how to use it the app worked really well last year sometimes you have little hiccups there but last time it was really good so it should be the same this year but yeah it's much easier in terms of time wise having people put their questions that way otherwise a bit like me talking blah 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 some people take a long time to get to the point so it's like just tell us your question <laughs> because they're short session each session is 60 minutes so by the time you've done the intros you do the Q&A and you do the wrap-up. We need to be short, sharp and sweet with some of them. Maybe we could go through some of the some of the highlights. I know, Dirk, it was announced earlier this week. Was it earlier this week? Was it last week now? A few more of the keynotes have been announced. Very exciting. Do you want to talk to those, Louise? I was just looking at them on the, on the Koala. That's why I was thinking. It's, hang on, I've got the article right here on the Koala. 18th July, so it's about a week ago. Well, there you go. I'm glad you're looking at it. Glad you're looking at it. We have had him speak at the conference, remember when, in about 2018. Jordan Nguyen, I don't know if you know Dr. Jordan Nguyen, who is a biotechnologist. He's doing a whole lot of work since we last had him, new work on humanity and IT, humanity and technology, and what it means to be human in this in this new world. So it was just too good of a match not to to bring Jordan back. And he's really engaging. He's young, he's dynamic, he's, and he's a great engaging speaker. So he'll be there on the, the Wednesday. Something a little bit different. I don't know if I should tell you, but maybe I will. Look, <laughs> just exclusive. Pretend, just pretend that we're not here. <laughs> uh, an international education news web- website sitting on the podcast. <laughs> well, you know, we... <laughs> We've got to do all of the formalities, you know, on the on the, the Wednesday morning, the welcomes, the official welcomes, the government welcomes and so on. But we've got a couple of international school students who are going to join us on stage to, to actually welcome people to the city that's that's hosting them at the moment, which I think is a really nice change. And I'm really sorry, but Kat has just joined me here. <laughs> he tends to walk across my keyboard. Um, so everything happens, I'll let you know. But we've also got Di McGrath. She's the Mission to Mars amazing person who also humanity to her is core to everything that she does. And then we've got Abbas Navare, who is a a refugee currently in New Zealand, but he's also been an international student. So he's going to talk about his human journey and his journey as an international student, as well as a refugee. He's got a really interesting tale to tell. And I think people will, will leave feeling rather inspired. The other plenary session that we've got on the Friday, we have not done this I tell a lie. We probably did it back in about 2001, so a very long time ago. But we're doing a, a session, a panel session with international students chaired by Stan Grant. And they'll be students, international students, a mix from different countries, all studying in Victoria, different sectors, to just talk about their experiences, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly of being, being an international student and what it means to, you know, in, in the impact it's having on their life. I think that one's really great. I, the, one of the things I think we've probably picked up on over the last six months, particularly with all these government policy changes, is that there's just been a lack of the student voice in it. So I think anything that we can do to be promoting the student voice, their experiences, and, and how some of these things affect them uh, is absolutely first rate. We've got to, as international educationalists, we've got to make sure that we remind ourselves that the student is the centre of what we do. It's not, to, it's not the business, it's not the marketing, it's not anything else, it's about the student. It's about the students. And if this if this works well, which I'm, I'm actually anticipating it will and be well received by the audience, I would hope to repeat that in future host cities with the students coming from wh- whatever host state or territory we happen to be in. Yeah, I think I think it's a good development. The, the other student session will be run by the PI, 
the PI usually run a cafe session. Rob, you probably and Dirk quite familiar with it. And there'll be a group of international students coming into that. So that's a really good opportunity for delegates to, to interact with students and hear the real story from them because it is about them. It's about the human element. Just remember that. Louise, beyond the plenary speakers, are there any other sessions that stand out in your mind? or anything that you think is really unique? There's some really interesting sessions around new marketing techniques, around t and in particular, transnational education. It's terrible when you assume people know your, your acronyms, but I know you know that. A lot around global demographic sh- shifts, both in terms of general population movements and the impact that that could have on international education, as well as the forecasting type thing that Navitas does on you know movements of students over the next, next decade and perhaps patterns they're seeing and so on. Can I pause you there for a second? If I think back to the first AIECs that I went to, and I'm talking probably 2003, one of the things that I see that changes is just the richness of the data. If I think back to those sessions, I remember, I think there were breakfast sessions that used to be done by IDP. You know, it was all about enrolments and, you know, coming from maybe 10 countries and there might be a few bar graphs. And that was pretty much it. These days, though, the, the, the data richness that you see, the forecasting data, it's just incredible. It really is. It's, it's changed the game and it's become, from a marketing perspective, I guess, more than anything, it's, it's become a much more complex environment, but also a much richer one, much more predictable and a lot more levers to be able to look at in terms of student decision making, how that may flow through, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have a comment on that at all? Or? Uh, look, no, I agree with you. And I think the, the program becomes richer and richer and the industry um, is benefiting so much from the research that's being done. And one of the things we do do in terms of trying to get a balance in the program, it's not just the balance of does this fit under students' t marketing pathways, schools, English language. It's also we then cross-cut with re- research and data insights, policy and practice insights, case study insights, so you sort of cut and dice the program in a multitude of ways. But no, absolutely, Dirk, I agree with you entirely. I think about, I was telling someone earlier today, I had a meeting with Study Melbourne, I can remember, and now I'm going to give away my age, but back in, I think it must have been 1989 or 1990 when it was the IDP conference, I did a session on computerising the international office. Go figure. <laughs> That's how... <laughs> That's how basic it was there and nobody was. Everybody was using hard copy, you know, student folders and applications and look where we are now. Different world. I still remember the days, I hope I don't want to say this, at Murdoch University where we got rid of our file compactors and everything went on, in, everything went digitally. We gained about half the office space back by getting rid of the file <laughs> compactors. It was amazing. Amazing. Special nod to uh, Study Link and Flywire. There we go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm, I'm just got the schedule here in front of me and but you guys were just talking a little bit about the sort of like the quant the analysis the analytics yeah. sort of side of things and what i love in here is you know the theme being the human element of course you know bringing in that the human side without wanting to restate it but in more like the art of the marketing you know like how bringing in the human and the, the creativity the content creation and that side of things because as we know like marketing's got the two sides of it whether that's marketing for international students or for learning abroad as well. I love the fact that you can find both sides of that at the conference. So Absolutely. Humanizing the digital customer journey, which I think is going to be interesting. Pauline Tan, who's always fantastic, and campfires. There's also campfire sessions. We were just talking before we started recording. There's campfires, there's barbecues. <laughs> we even, can I, have, can I say, did you go to any of the campfires last year? Because there's actually a little campfire in the middle. Rather cute. It's not actually hot because we're not allowed to do that, but there is a campfire. But the campfires are great because they're really, they're very interactive. Like you'll notice with the session formats that there's a mix of some that are just the downloads of information with some opportunity for, you know, Q&A. And there's others like the cafes and the campfires that are really interactive. The Inspire sessions are also important to talk about. I mean, that was something I invented a few years back, but they're actually really good because you get 15 minutes of presentation time so they're, they're concise session. exactly but you get 15 mm. minutes if you think you're on a panel you might get 10 minutes time as a speaker if there's a group of you but the inspire sessions are quite good so they're grouped in groups of three which allows 15 minutes of q a at the end or at the end of the presentation so they're actually uh, some people seem to think they're the booby prize but they're not they're actually very good because you just get to speak there's no interruption 
and then there's time for Q and A at the end. So so they're really good as well. And in terms of the the mix of countries that we've got, we used to I used to develop sessions called World in Focus, and we'd either focus on a particular region or com- country. We've taken out that title this year purely because so much has come through the call for proposals covering from Saudi Arabia to Latin Europe. I had to read that twice thinking, did they mean Latin? No, they mean Latin Europe. You know, India, China, of course, South Korea, Taiwan, all sorts of mixture of mix of countries and regions are in the program from different perspectives too, from either TNE or from marketing or from student experience or learning abroad, Rob, as you mentioned. But I think bringing us back to the human element as you picked up with that in, in terms of marketing and recruitment, I sort of feel post-COVID, there was a ten- tendency to think we can do this all online. We'd never actually need to physically connect with anyone, not quite not quite the case, I think we're finding. Yeah. So there'll be some interesting discussions at the town hall, I think, too, about the caps and about visas and migration strategies and yeah. So the one that really stands out to me, and I, I know that I've I've mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I love the barbecue conversations. If I again I go back over time in in my time in this sector, we used to be referred to as a cottage industry and, and we're now the fourth largest contributor to GDP. We're a massive, massive industry sector within the Australian economy. The one thing that I think we really lack, though, is understanding outside of the sector, that people who don't work in the sector actually don't really get what we what we do. The barbecue conversation sessions is one that I love because I think it's a, again, it's, a, it's based on a human element. It's having a conversation, but it's how do we actually talk to people outside of our sector, about our sector, and get them on board, get them understanding, get them as little champions, I guess, if you want to put it that way, in terms of being able to, to support. So when these policy changes come up, it's not that the, the immediate story isn't international students are taking your houses. It's international students are important to us and they're important socially, they're important culturally, and yes, they're important economically as well, but they're important. And I just think there's a real lack of understanding outside of our sector on that one. So that's the session Absolutely. that I'm, I, I am going to be at and I'm looking forward Please. to Sally and, and Andrew presenting it. <laughs> no, I think that'll be a really good one. There's something for everyone in the program whether it's from a government perspective or a you know, provider pers- perspective or a student perspective or from research insights, a lot of really interesting programs, sorry, sessions. And I think people are going to have trouble picking which one they want to go to. So my advice, if there's more than one person from an organisation, sort of try to not go to the same sessions together. So Louise, with the presenters, are they, will they be presenting all in person or will some of them be, be, be Zoomed in, shall we say, virtually? No, look, it's the human element this year. So this year, everybody's got to be there in person to speak. Face to face. Face to face, in person, nice. in real life. So we say IRL. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm calling it biggest AIEC ever. But, uh, until next year. Until next year. Next year. <laughs> and if you're, if you're listening along, you're watching watching this podcast, now is the time to actually sign up. Early birds, the super early, early birds close on 31st July, which is... Wednesday next week, and there's a super good discount. It's about 300 bucks off. So whether you're somebody who's been to AIEC before, or even if you're new to the industry, and you're looking to try and learn more about the breadth and depth of everything we do, this really is your opportunity to spend some of that PD money that's set aside for your education and level up in the best possible way. So jump on the AIEC website as quickly as you can, aiec.idp.com. And make sure you get yourself signed up by next Wednesday. Please do. And look, I'm, I just do the program content. That's the most important. But can I say the dinner is going to be amazing, but that's a surprise and that's a secret and you'll all find out soon. Oh, you're, you're teasing us now. I know. I like to do that. Cracks <laughs> <laughs> Elliot gave me when she was on the podcast a couple of, couple of months ago. We will get that eventually. <laughs> well, what you, fantastic to have you on the podcast to talk to us about the, the upcoming conference and we have to do this again sometime because you've got such an incredible story in Australian higher education so make sure we have to get back, get you on at some point to talk about things outside the conference. Uh, no, that'd be great because I'd love to talk about some of the capacity building initiatives which is a different form of international education that I'm involved in around the world so that'd be great but look thank you and yeah register early super early bird closes next week nice to talk to you both wonderful having you 
with us, Louise. And as always, for those of you listening along at home, for all of your international education news, thekoalanews.com is your source of truth. Dirk, fantastic to see you as always, mate. And I'll see you on our next news episode. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Louise. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.